The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. The Taliban, they are equally interested in benefiting from India and China. I think only time will tell which country has more to offer the Islamic Emirate, which manages to gain more political influence to harm the interests of the other one. For the timing, it's too soon to predict whichever way the situation is going to go. In this episode, how a Taliban-ruled Afghanistan affects security in the region. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. It's been close to two years since the Taliban returned to power in Afghanistan. In that time, international media has focused mainly on the massive shocks to the country's economic and food security, and its still unfolding humanitarian crisis, with little coverage of how the latest iteration of the Taliban regime affects security in the wider region. Afghanistan's neighbours include not only global players, China and India, but also regional powerhouse Iran, a crowded and economically precarious Pakistan, as well as three Central Asian republics, each with its own interests to protect and opportunities to exploit just across the border. It's not just differences in politics or ideology. Other key concerns focus on the Taliban's alleged harbouring of extremist or terrorist groups, continued high number of displaced Afghans sheltering abroad, and the ramped-up production of opium for export. So how great a threat to regional security is Afghanistan under the Taliban? How are relations across borders being reset to accommodate or even capitalise on the power shift in Kabul? And how is the Afghan government navigating its own path in the region in an attempt to secure its own interests? Joining me to discuss how Afghanistan under Taliban rule affects the region is South Asia political scientist Dr Zahid Ahmed from Deakin University. Welcome back to Ear to Asia, Zahid. Thank you, Ellie. Thanks for the invitation. Can we start with a big picture view broadly? What has Afghanistan's new Taliban government meant for security in the region? I think it meant different things for different countries. Uh, If we look at the neighbouring countries, of course, all of them were on the same page as far as the Taliban's peace agreement with the US is concerned, which was signed in Doha. But uh, when looking at their traditional or non-traditional security concerns, emerging from today's Afghanistan since the Taliban's takeover a couple of years ago, as you rightly pointed out. They all have now different concerns uh, and somewhat similar as well. As far as neighboring countries are concerned, uh, Iran and Pakistan remain the two major countries uh, through which drugs are trafficked uh, from Afghanistan and in transit through these countries to other parts of the Middle East and also to other parts of the world as well. Then there are concerns in relation to terrorism, which, of course, uh, looking at just from Pakistan's point of view, terrorism in Pakistan in just past you know year and a half, uh, it has increased quite significantly with groups like Islamic State, Khorasan uh, province, and also anti-Pakistan terrorist group, Tariqa Taliban Pakistan. They have been regularly attacking not just uh, state institutions like the military and the police, but also other places like, for example, Shia mosques being attacked by the Islamic State, uh, Khorasan province. But we have to look at also the immediate sort of reaction. So first I pointed out that they, these regional countries were on the same page with regard to the withdrawal of international troops. I think they all were looking at the short-term gains. Iran had concerns in relation to the presence of U.S. troops. Similar was the case of Russia and China. And Pakistan also wanted you know, international troops to leave to see, you know, Taliban return to power and fulfill its dream of having another pro-Pakistan regime there. But as far as even Pakistan's interest is concerned, you know, soon after the Taliban's takeover, even the prime minister then, Imran Khan, he said that the Afghan people had broken the shackles of slavery and so on. There, there was kind of a celebration going on. But I think they soon realized that that was just not it. And Pakistan was going to suffer from its spillover. And 
the past you know year and a half has already shown in in the shape of terrorism in the shape of more and more drugs being trafficked uh, into pakistan from afghanistan and also the issue of refugees you know pakistan and iran have been hosting the largest number of afghan refugees for nearly uh, three to four decades uh, look at you know recent reports every day there are thousands of afghans standing either on iranian border or or the border with pakistan and they want to come to these countries either for work or for education or for health treatment and so on so the crises are very much visible you know in the, in the shape of humanitarian crisis or economic crisis in afghanistan and the main issue here is kind of like a chicken and egg situation you know whether the international regime first has to recognize the new islamic emirate of afghanistan and then provide it with much needed humanitarian aid or economic aid or the taliban or the emirate first has to fulfill its commitments in relation to women's rights in relation to creating an inclusive government for the time being it doesn't look like it's going either way and the people of uh, afghanistan they are suffering and we see that the countries in the region they are already suffering in some ways so there's so much to unpack there in what you just had to say zahid but just on that very last point do you think that we're at a period of a sort of a stalemate if you like where countries are not prepared to recognize and and move forward and the taliban is not reacting to demands from external countries regarding human rights so would you call it right now a stalemate Yes absolutely I think it was kind of a writing on the wall looking at the Taliban's performance in the past you know their regime during 1996 and 2001 uh, there were massive human rights violation through you know for example attacks on uh, Hazara Shias through curbs on women's mobility their employment their education and so on and of course you know with the the most notorious incident of how taliban destroyed the buddha statues in bamiyan back then despite so much international pressure and this time around i think you know there was so much talk of the new taliban or good taliban but as we have seen in the past year or so uh, that you know it is only a myth that there are new taliban they are behaving in a similar fashion they never made actually those commitments that they were ever going to you know respect human rights and anyways they always said that they were going to you know implement uh, islamic law or sharia and then provide human rights through that so they they continue to justify their position based on that and in my opinion the taliban themselves they have done nothing to actually justify being legitimized or being recognized by any other countries the countries for example they recognized them in the past pakistan the uae and saudi arabia they are even hesitant to recognize this new regime and mainly because they do not want to be blamed especially the case of pakistan pakistan does not want to be blamed like in the past for supporting this repressive regime in afghanistan which has no respect for human rights and which is still sheltering some of these uh, terrorist groups like al qaeda and and tehreek e taliban pakistan for example so the situation is very different and of course it's a stalemate until i think this issue is addressed of recognizing this new islamic emirate i think any country will find it very difficult to extend its full cooperation to the today's regime in afghanistan So let's go through uh, each of those issues that are affecting regional security and and we'll get to to drugs and refugees but I want to start with terrorism as you just say the sheltering of terrorist groups can we look first at the presence of Islamic state in Afghanistan it's been described as the Taliban's main military threat how big a risk is the presence of Islamic state you know islamic state has been present in afghanistan for quite some time and in the past it has played a role in the taliban establishing some cooperation with the regional states like iran who have concerns in relation to the presence of islamic state in afghanistan because islamic state is clearly anti shia and they have consistently been attacking shia populations in in the region especially afghanistan and and pakistan as well so it's very much uh, i think taliban's biggest challenge at the moment that they have to address this a big problem in terms of the security not just of afghanistan but also that poses serious threats to the security of regional states and in the past i must say that the taliban have been actually fighting islamic state in the country 
So there's evidence to suggest that they will continue to do so, considering Islamic State as being their key enemy in the country. The Taliban, actually, they do not face any other major sort of resistance in the country, so they can focus on that front. But facing you know, other kinds of challenges, economic and humanitarian, for the time being, they are distracted. And of course, there are issues in relation to their capacity to handle the problem as far as Islamic State is concerned. I want to come back to that issue of, of their capacity to handle the problem because, of course, it is a big problem. I mean, just at the end of last year, we saw attacks on embassies of China and Pakistan and Russia in Kabul. But it's not just Islamic State. What about al-Qaeda, Zahid? The Taliban's got very close ties with al-Qaeda. And to what extent is Afghanistan a safe haven as it was under the first Taliban government for al-Qaeda and al-Qaeda leaders? You know, it very much remains the same kind of scenario, which was at the time of 9-11, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Emirate back then, they had very close cooperation. And one of the reasons why Afghanistan was attacked and the Taliban lost its government in 2001 was also because they could not uh, take a U-turn on its uh, relationship with uh, Al-Qaeda. And same is the case now. Now, Al-Qaeda is a much bigger problem. In the past 20 years or so, it has expanded across the region, in South Asia especially, and still it maintains very close relationship with the Taliban. There's another evidence also available of the Taliban providing shelter to close to 8,000 anti-Pakistan terrorists, mainly belonging to the tariq taliban Pakistan. So there is pressure from these countries. Uh, you know, there was an incident in which Chinese citizens were attacked at the time when the Taliban took over Afghanistan and Pakistan asked China to speak to the Taliban to take actions against these terrorist organizations. And this is clearly against their commitment under the peace deal they signed with the U.S. because it's clearly stated that they, the Taliban would not allow any terrorist organization to use the Afghan soil against other countries. And that's a clear violation of that. There, there have been concerns shared by Pakistan, by China, directly with the Taliban. But as of now, there are no serious actions taken by the Islamic Emirate against these terrorist groups. And it's also highly unlikely, considering how closely they have worked together. So there's a lot of evidence to suggest that anti-Pakistan terrorists belonging to TTP, they fought with the Taliban against the international troops in Afghanistan. So that relationship is quite strong. And in, in the case with the Pakistani Taliban, the relationship is you know, not just limited to fighting against external threats. There are kinship relations. They are uh, all Pashtuns. They have historic relations as well. So it's not going to be easy for either side, either TTP or the Taliban, to suddenly break the relationship. So when you look at that, the security situation for Pakistan, and you look at the history of relations with the Taliban, under the second iteration of the Taliban that is currently in power, how is Pakistan handling that relationship? Is it much different to first time around? It's very different to the first time around. So the first time around, Pakistan's influence was much more visible in Kabul, because the Taliban had very few external partners. Uh, and the UAE and Saudi Arabia, despite having recognized the first Taliban regime, their involvement was very limited, I think, only to providing funding to the Islamic Emirate back then. But when it came to on-the-ground cooperation, even in many of the Afghan ministries, there were Pakistani advisors. And in the banking sector and all of that, Pakistan's you know, influence was much more visible back then. But this time around, that's not the case. The Taliban, they continue to collaborate with other countries uh, like uh, China, for instance. Iran is now their number one trading partner. Uh, Iran continues to provide oil to Afghanistan. That's one example. Another is uh, the Taliban. They are discussing with India, which is Pakistan's arch rival, possibilities of continuing that collaboration that India had built in the past 20 years in relation to providing training to the Afghan National Army. So now, you know, the Taliban are very different as well. You know, that's why the relationship with Pakistan is very different. And Pakistan's influence has decreased significantly. If we look at the literature on proxy wars and we look through that lens, Pakistan's relationship with the Taliban, Pakistan's ability to control Taliban is very limited now. 
because the Taliban in the past, they had their families living in Pakistan. Many of their leaders were living in Pakistan. They were traveling on Pakistani passports. That's not the case now They're because they have achieved their purpose of establishing the Islamic Emirate in Afghanistan. So Pakistan's ability also in terms of uh, economic relations is very limited as Iran has taken the lead there. And there are other countries that are having more economic potential. For example, China has signed uh, agreements with the Islamic Emirate for investing and mining there. And India is very much interested in doing the same there. So uh, that kind of monopoly that Pakistan had in the past in terms of being the key external actor in Kabul during the Taliban's time is no longer the case. And coupled with that, though, it may, there's a loss of influence. There are other economic partners for the Taliban. But also, I mean, there's a, the current economic deterioration in Pakistan itself. What impact does that have on the relationship, but also Pakistan's ability to, uh, in some way, counter the regional security risks? You know, Pakistan's economy is in deep crisis for the past several years, and it's, it's clear through Pakistan going repeatedly back to the IMF and also to its key partners like China and Saudi Arabia and the UAE for bailouts. So it's clear and perhaps that has played also a role in Pakistan's flexibility in terms of allowing the Taliban, uh, although it doesn't control them fully, it could still exercise some influence. But now Pakistan is also showing that flexibility by understanding that it cannot solve all of Afghanistan's problems in terms of humanitarian crisis, economic crisis, and so on. And there are other countries with far more bigger economic potential like China and India who can really solve Afghanistan's problem. And ultimately, it's all good for Pakistan, you know, because Pakistan is looking at geoeconomics. Pakistan is looking at benefiting the most from China's investments in Pakistan by linking the port in Gwadar, which China has built through the Belt and Road Initiative, with the Central Asian republics who are landlocked. So Pakistan has a much bigger vision. And the missing piece of puzzle in this case, of course, is Afghanistan. Because if there's no peace and security in Afghanistan, then Pakistan will never be able to fully meet uh, the potential of all that investment that it has received under China's Belt and Road Initiative. I want to uh, come to, to China, which I will in a minute, but you did make the point there that Iran has stepped up as a major trading partner. If we can just look a little bit more closely at Iran, because uh, despite knowing the Taliban's position on Shia Islam, Iran has been supportive of uh, of the Taliban while they were insurgents. And now that they're back in power, what what is the relationship? Is it a purely economic one, uh, one that can see that Iran sees benefits financially, or is there more to it? You know, in the past, of course, when the Taliban they were you know persecuting the minority Shias, Iran uh, had serious concerns. Then, in the past twenty years or so, Iran wanted the international troops to leave Afghanistan. That has uh, been achieved as the international troops withdrew in 2021. And now, you know, the main concern, Iran wants to continue whatever form of also soft power influence it has in the country. In the past 20 years, it's not just economic cooperation. Iran invested heavily in the Afghan media and also in the, the university sector in the country. And Iran would like to maintain that influence. You know, uh, Dari which is similar to Persian, is still you know, one of the official languages in Afghanistan. There's a sizable Shia population. Iran has that historic soft power influence in the country. And now on top of that, this economic influence being the number one trading partner. And Iran, in some ways, you know, also used that to its advantage in the Middle East. In Syria, Iran was able to recruit these Shias from Afghanistan to fight in, in Syria, uh, in support of the Bashar al-Assad regime. So Iran would like to maintain that influence, uh, although it will still be cautious in terms of the Taliban's uh, track record and how they, in the past, they treated the Shias. Um, well, I, especially, I was going to say, the Hazara minority, which makes up around, uh, I think, 18% of the population in Afghanistan, most of them are Shia, this time round... Has the Taliban taken a different approach to the Hazara? I think symbolically. So symbolically, 
on the issue of creating an inclusive government you know inclusive by any mean would not mean giving one ministerial position to you know a shia minority in this case hazara inclusive in my opinion would mean uh, more than that but that's what the taliban have done as far as their interim government is concerned it's it's quite symbolic and that provides clear indications of them following the same line that they followed in the past in terms of the majoritarian rule of the pashtuns in the country with more pressure from the outside i see a little of that happening of course because the international community has little leverage in today's afghanistan by not providing you know that level of economic aid for influence or for example not maintaining that level of also economic cooperation with afghanistan so there's going to be very little pressure from outside and that's why the taliban are gradually reverting to their old style of governance uh, whether on the issue of women's education or also on the issue of minority rights in the country how weak is the afghan economy as very weak there's you know and even in the past there was no economy it was always aid dependent economy in the past when uh, the us led uh, nato mission was there half of the gdp came from uh, foreign aid although there's much potential in terms of energy resources in terms of minerals but that potential was never fully exploited or explored which is something now china is doing through some mining projects and uh, india is interested in but other than that there is you know of course agriculture sector but then the whole side of illicit drug trafficking through afghanistan of course which has benefited a lot of these you know terrorist groups that are present in the country so can you give us a, a picture i guess of the extent to which drug trafficking has actually increased since the taliban's return to power it's hard to say to a degree to which it, it has increased in the past 2 years it had already increased since you know uh, 2010 a lot uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest for example a un report mentioned that the taliban they were making close to 500 million dollars through illegal production of drugs and and trafficking and most of that trafficking happened through iran and pakistan through other parts of the world 90% even to date happens through iran to middle east and other parts of the world especially europe and so on and the rest of that through through pakistan and ultimately its impacts on those countries are quite visible and that also gives some indication that drug trafficking has increased from afghanistan in recent years if we look at the number of drug addicts in neighboring countries in iran alone and in pakistan even in big universities in pakistan's major cities uh, there's a big problem with university students being drug addict and that has only happened in the past you know few years or so there was not an historic problem uh so that shows that you know this is a growing problem but of course you know we do not have the exact numbers for how much you know it has increased given it's obviously an important source of income for the taliban what are other countries what are neighboring countries trying to do to counter to to try and address the drug problem given it has a direct impact on their own populations you know i think neighboring countries immediate reaction was to beef of security on the borders and which they did while the taliban they were taking over the country india seized its biggest uh, you can say illicit drug traffic through afghanistan and on the on the port in mumbai uh, so that happened and similar is the case in pakistan's anti narcotic force has increased its security and operations in the country and similar is the case of iran pakistan has been fencing its border with afghanistan which according to the latest reports was completed to 90% extent but then these drug traffickers they came up with these like very innovative ways of still being able to traffic drugs across the border there were videos on on showed on al jazeera that these traffickers they had uh, developed these you know big slingshots and they were using them to throw drugs across the fences and so for the time being the neighboring states uh reactions are limited to more security on the borders and they are not going to the source of the problem and the source of the power problem remains the taliban's reliance on drug money and that's how taliban and other terrorist organizations they have funded themselves in afghanistan for the past you know a few decades and in the past also if we look at the first taliban regime that had taken 
no actions for the first five years or so against uh, the poppy cultivation and drug trafficking from Afghanistan. And by 2000, they took actions against poppy cultivation only when the price of drugs in the international market had gone down and it was no longer lucrative sort of business for the Islamic Emirate back then. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website which again, you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Ali Moore, and I'm joined by South Asia political scientist Dr Zahid Ahmed. We're discussing the impact of Afghanistan's Taliban government on regional security. And Zahid, as we move through the various neighbours of Afghanistan, can we just look north uh, for a minute to the Central Asian republics? What has the second Taliban government in Kabul meant for them and how do they approach security concerns? Central Asian republics have been having serious concerns in relation to the Islamic State and its presence in Afghanistan. Uh, They have also directly suffered from the problem because the Islamic State has been able to recruit their citizens for wars in in, in the Middle East. There were so many reports of youngsters being recruited by the Islamic State from Central Asian republics, not only the ones who were residing in their home countries, but also the ones who were working in Russia as migrant workers. And they were lured by the Islamic State to go uh, for this jihad or holy cause. And many of them, they died there. And some of them who returned, they were captured by the authorities of Central Asian republics. You look at those reports, uh, many of them, they are still uh, imprisoned because these Central Asian republics, they want to send a clear message that whoever is going to join the Islamic State and wishes to return is not going to be accepted with open arms. So they have these ongoing concerns. But of course, their border security is very tight, uh, so they are not as vulnerable as the the case of Pakistan, especially, which still has the porous borders with uh, Afghanistan and continues to face that problem. You mentioned earlier about Pakistan asking China to talk to Kabul over the presence of terrorist groups and indeed China's Belt and Road initiatives. So how does China see Afghanistan under the latest Taliban government, what does it see as the threats to Beijing and what does it see as the opportunities? So Beijing has its economic interests, it has its geopolitical interests linked to Afghanistan as far as the whole project of reviving the old Silk Road is concerned. Afghanistan is a key part of that. China has been investing in Afghanistan uh, in the past and continues to do so. But as far as immediate security concerns, there have been attacks on Chinese citizens, not in China, but in Pakistan. I believe because they are more vulnerable there. Pakistan does not have that kind of surveillance uh, or heightened security, as is the case of China. So it continues to be more vulnerable in the case of that. And there are more and more Chinese citizens coming to Pakistan every month to work in the China-Pakistan economic corridor. And of course, the vulnerability will increase as the Islamic State and these anti-Pakistan terrorist groups, they have taken refuge in Afghanistan and they will use that uh, to their advantage to also hurt China's interests in the region. And of course, you know, many of these terrorist organizations, whether you talk about Al-Qaeda, Tariqa Taliban, Pakistan, they want to show solidarity with Muslims in China, in Xinjiang. They also hear of the reports of a kind of uh, genocide happening there of of Muslims and and repression from the state and its atrocities on the minority Muslims there. So, of course, it fits into their narrative, the narrative promoted by these terrorist organizations, and they will, you know, avail whatever opportunity available to hurt China's interests in the region. 
So going back to the question that you raised uh, at the beginning of our podcast about how the Taliban is distracted and the bigger question of the capacity to deal with extremist organisations and terrorist organisations like Islamic State, how capable is the Taliban of responding to concerns that China would have? I have my own doubts in relation to the Taliban's uh, capacity. Of course, they have taken over the country because the international troops left and the Taliban virtually faced no resistance from the Afghan National Army. It was kind of like a smooth uh, takeover other than a small scale resistance in the Panjshir Valley. So considering that, you know, it's hard to be realistic about any assessment of Taliban's military capacity. But of course, they will doubt remain because they the only thing they know or they had learned in the past was guerrilla style fighting. And now taking control of the state is a whole different dynamic. They're still dealing with the issue of uh, mainstreaming the 300,000 strong Afghan National Army. They still haven't made any major breakthroughs there. Uh, that remains, I think, one of the pending issues. Once that is done, they are able to uh, re-establish a key institute of the state, which is the military. Then, of course, we can talk about the next steps in relation to the Taliban setting up a strong anti-terrorism task force or military and then launch its operations. But again, you know, like they will always have this limited capacity because this requires a lot of resources, even in, in relation to surveillance, in relation to intelligence and not just the weapons and capacity building. They require much more for which they will always be reliant on their key partners who have this potential either in, in relation to providing capacity building or in relation to providing funding that they need. You know, China is known for building these, you know, smart cities or, or safe cities with, with the surveillance that, of course, China has used to its advantage. There are other countries that are also acquiring those technologies from China. In Pakistan, you know, Pakistan has used that effectively against terrorism. So it's a matter of time, I think, and commitment, or you can say understanding among the regional actors. For the time being, there's no ad hoc mechanism established at the regional level to deal with this problem or to increase Taliban's capacity to handle the Islamic State. But do you think that given China would appear to have the capacity, do you see that China is looking to play a greater role in countering terrorist organisations? And if they are, would the Taliban welcome that? I think in relation to the Islamic State, of course, the Taliban would welcome that because the, the Islamic State poses uh, the Islamic Emirate as a serious or the biggest challenge. And of course, it's indirectly affecting China as well. The anti-China terrorists, so China has this interest. China has been having historic interest in dealing with the terrorism problem in the region. And that was actually the key motivation behind the establishment of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which focused on these you know, so-called three evils of separatism, extremism, and terrorism, for example. And they had also, through the SCO, established the Afghanistan Contact Group to deal with this issue. Afghanistan, although is not a member of the organization and it is not going to be in near future because none of the SEO member states have recognized the, the Islamic Emirate. But still, I think China would lead that uh, move in collaboration with its regional partners like Pakistan to address the terrorism problem emerging from today's Afghanistan. What about India? You touched on India earlier and they, of course, invested a lot of money and infrastructure into Afghanistan in the past 20 years. They closed their diplomatic mission in 2021 when the Taliban took over again. Uh, what's the situation now? I think India has managed to find a breakthrough with the Taliban, although you know their initial reaction just showed what they had done in the past when the Taliban took over in 1996. India back then had only one diplomatic mission when they had, they had shut down. This time around, they had several uh, with embassy in Kabul. They, they closed those missions and left, considering that the Taliban's return as Pakistan's win in two days Afghanistan. But they soon realized that the two days Afghanistan, they are much more keen to collaborate with India, a country that had actually provided 
close to $2 billion in development assistance in the past 20 years or so. So they are very much interested because India has that economic potential. And India was closely collaborating with Afghan national uh, intelligence and with also providing training to the Afghan national army. And so through their initial exchanges in Doha, they have now managed to reach to that stage uh, where India has actually opened its uh, embassy in Kabul. And India is also very keen to continue providing support to the Afghan National Army. How, how do you see India and Afghanistan with China and Afghanistan? T- to a certain extent, are India and China competing when it comes to areas like trade and resources? Yes, of course. There's this natural competition. It's not just the competition over Afghanistan's natural resources. It's a geopolitical competition as well and geoeconomic. India has built the the sport in the city of Chabahar in Iran for the very reason uh, that China has built the port in Gawadar in Pakistan because they want to provide this seaport access to the landlocked states, including Afghanistan and the Central Asian republics, and more so Central Asian republics because they are energy rich. And both China and India, they they need those energy resources, especially natural gas from Central Asian republics as they, their industrialization grows and their populations are growing as well in both countries. Their energy demands are increasing at an alarming pace. And that kind of competition is natural. And of course, that competition involves Afghanistan. And Afghanistan, I think, in the previous governments also, they were trying to maintain balanced relations with India and China because they understand they have more to gain through that approach by maintaining kind of like neutrality in this case or a balanced approach. And the Taliban are doing the same. They are equally interested in benefiting from India and China for the time being. I think only time will tell which country has more to offer to them and which manages to gain more political influence to harm the interests of the other one. You know, for the time being, it's too soon to predict whichever way the situation is going to go. Sahid, we, we touched on the issue of people movement and, and refugees earlier, but if we're looking at regional security, obviously regional stability is incredibly important. Are those vast numbers of refugees, largely in places like Pakistan and Iran, are they a source of regional instability? Yeah, no, regional instability, if you link that to impacts on maybe local economies, of course, when refugees in such large numbers, and Pakistan are close to 3 million and I think about two and a half million in Iran. Um, the massive unemployment in both countries, and when refugees become cheaper source of uh, labor, basically, in those countries, so it has that level of impact on local economies, and you can say social stability. But there's very little evidence. There have been uh, cases here and there in which you know one or two refugees were involved in terrorist incidents. But there's no bigger evidence to suggest that there's a significant penetration of terrorist groups as far as the refugee populations are concerned. And Iran and Pakistan, they treat them differently. In Iran, most of the refugees are made to live in refugee camps. And so it doesn't pose very serious uh, security risk in that sense. That's how Iran manages. In Pakistan, your refugees, they have that level of freedom. They can move easily across the country gain employment, invest in businesses, and so on. So the the dynamics are very different, and so are the impacts. What will happen to those populations, particularly those in Iran who who are still in refugee camps? Yeah, I think they'll continue to live in refugee camps, although, you know, the policies or the acceptance of refugees in both countries have changed in recent years of Pakistan, that whole heartedly or with open arms accepted millions of Afghan refugees in the 1980s. Now the policy is different. Pakistan is very much interested in returning those refugees, considering its own challenges of security and its own economic challenges and so on. Uh, But that might not happen because the Taliban, they have been asking to be given more time to decide about the situation. They are dealing with its own mess at home and you know, with a lot of challenges that we have talked about uh, earlier as well. So considering those dynamics, uh, there's very, very little likelihood of many of those refugees is returning. But unlike in the past, now these countries, especially Iran and Pakistan, they have very strong border security. So it has been 
very difficult for the refugees to move in as easily as was the case in the past. In Pakistan, soon after the Taliban's takeover, the maximum number of refugees coming into Pakistan uh, on a daily basis was recorded at 3,000, which was you know, far, far less than in the 1980s or 1990s. And it's mainly because of a lot of restrictions. Pakistan also you know, closes its borders very frequently with Afghanistan due to, of course, you know, political issues. Um, but that, of course, also has made it very difficult for the refugees to come in. And now also people need to have valid visas to enter Pakistan, which was always uh, the case of Afghans going to Iran. But Pakistan also has a very strict policy on this. So now the matter is not of more and more refugees coming into these countries. The matter is that how sooner these countries are going to force the Taliban to take back these refugees. And I think that will pose another very big a humanitarian crisis whenever these countries decide to do that. We're coming to a close of our conversation, but but let's look at stability inside Afghanistan itself as we've discussed all those challenges that the Taliban is facing. How stable is the regime? It's a matter of defining what stability is from their perspective, I think. Their immediate concern was to stop these thousands of people leaving the country. If you remember when the Taliban took over Afghanistan. These you know, images came of people rushing uh, towards the Kabul airport, and they wanted to get onto any flight to leave the country. They did not want to show those images to the world. So that's now to their benefit. You know, that's not happening at that scale. And then, you know, of course, um, stability can be looked at through other ways, which is you know, local level of resistance. Of course, there have been civil society demonstrations against Taliban's. Uh, restrictions on on uh, women's employment and young girls' education and so on. And that is unprecedented, in my opinion. They never faced this level of resistance in the past. And that will keep irritating them because now with the, through social media, you know, the news travels so quickly, you know, people are able to record those videos and then circulate them across through WhatsApp and other, other social media channels. I think that will keep denting the Taliban's image that they have changed. And I think the world has already realized that the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan has not changed at all from its uh, past experience and when they ruled the country in the past. So considering that, that level of domestic resistance will continue to grow as the Taliban regime is likely to become more oppressive in relation to human rights, especially And most of all, I think we have to go back to the issue of legitimacy. Although the peace deal with the U.S. that provided them with some legitimacy that they always wanted, that, you know, of course, in the peace deal, the U.S. was very careful. They never said that they recognized the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, but they were referred to as the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan in the deal. But now I think a major challenge to the stability of the Islamic Emirate remains its international recognition. There's no country that has recognized them, and that will continue to bother them, I think, in future. And I don't see that you know any country will recognize them in the near future as well. And against that backdrop, which is not irrelevant to the question of security risk, how do you see the security risks changing in the coming years? Do you see a status quo? Do you see the situation improving if China becomes more involved? Or could it in fact deteriorate? You know, for the timing, if we look at and then the short run, I think it will keep deteriorating. And that will ultimately put more pressure on China, which has higher stakes, uh, more pressure on Pakistan, which of course, is hoping for stability in its neighborhood to uh, materialize the benefits from China's investments in Pakistan, especially the Gwadar port and linking with the Central Asia. Pakistan has its whole foreign policy on connecting with Central Asia that won't be possible if Afghanistan is insecure. So, of course, considering that, uh, not in the short run, but in the long run, I think these countries, Pakistan through China, will try to exert more influence in Afghanistan to achieve its national interests or its geoeconomic interests uh, linked to Central Asia and also linked to Afghanistan as well. Are you optimistic? I'm not very optimistic. Frankly speaking on the issue, considering 
the Taliban's close collaboration with Al Qaeda, very close collaboration with the Tariqe Taliban Pakistan. I don't see them taking a U turn, which is quite common in terms of you know political parties and a democratic world. U turns are very common, but in the case of the Taliban, considering their cultural background and their upbringing through these Deobandi madrasas, and considering how ultra conservative they are on certain issues, I don't see them taking a U-turn in terms of their collaboration with these terrorist organizations. Zahid, thank you so much for being so generous with your insights and and, and giving us your time uh, for Ear to Asia. Many thanks indeed. Thank you, Ali. It was a pleasure. Our guest has been Dr. Zahid Ahmed from Deakin University. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify or Google Podcasts. Please rate and review us. It helps new listeners find the show and put a good word in for us on social media. This episode was recorded on the 14th of April, 2023. Producers were Calvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2023, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company.